to give the running order for our guests, if that's okay. So I propose we proceed with the following opening statements in this order. First, we'll start with Owen, who's going to speak on behalf of the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation, Tim Fenn on behalf of the Irish Hotels Federation, Paul Kelly on behalf of Falsh Ireland, and then Orla Gleeson on behalf of the department. Is that okay, folks? Great. So, without further ado, I would like you to, to ask Owen if you'd like to take the floor. Um, you have three minutes, and uh, we'll then move on to the rest of the witnesses. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. And sound okay? Um, thank you for the invitation this afternoon um, to address this committee on the subject of the rising cost of tourism accommodation. The Irish Tourism Industry Confederation is the representative group for the broad tourism industry, and our members consist of all key stakeholders within the sector, including carriers, accommodation providers, attractions, tour operators, restaurants, vintners, and others. Pre-pandemic, tourism was the country's largest indigenous industry and biggest regional employer, supporting 270,000 jobs nationally. That is where we want to get back to. The last two years have been economically harrowing for Irish tourism, with estimated losses of over 12 billion euro as international visitors were kept away. But for government support and business from the domestic market, the industry simply would not have survived. Since earlier this year, though, when restrictions were finally lifted, travel and tourism has bounced back strongly. The challenge now for business is delivering capacity to meet soaring demand. This is not unique to Ireland and has been seen at airports, hotels, car rental providers and hospitality businesses right across the EU. Today, understandably, the focus is on Irish tourism, but it is important to note that many of the pressures and issues at home are mirrored abroad. Certainly, the short-term recovery of the tourism industry has been much stronger than anybody could have anticipated. A pent-up desire to travel, along with consumer savings and deferred bookings, has meant that demand has surged. Combined with soaring cost inflation pressures, capacity shortfalls and labour shortages, this has resulted in increased prices charged to both the domestic tourist and international visitor alike. It is only right that the spotlight is on value, and retaining value is vitally important for Irish tourism's recovery. Today's discussion is on the cost of tourism accommodation, which has risen sharply in recent months. It's important to start with the data. The average rate of a room in Dublin, for example, in April, the most recent month for which we have independent data, was 154 euro, which was 16% higher than the same month pre-pandemic. A similar percentage increase is anticipated for May. This rate of increase is on a par with European city peers, and this was also a month that 12 concerts and events took place in the capital city, meaning that many hotels were sold out. Two principal reasons why price has risen, prices have risen are escalating cost pressures and an acute shortage of supply. A hotelier in West Cork recently told me about his 25% hike in insurance costs, the 40% increase in linen costs, and the doubling of his electricity bill. These cost increases and more are borne out by every independent economic study, and understandably, they will drive the cost of a room rate higher. There has also been a sharp reduction in tourism accommodation supply. Since the war in Ukraine, government have taken a significant number of rooms out of the system to rightly facilitate those fleeing the conflict. There are a number of new hotels due to open this year and next, and as supply restrictions are eased, this will help alleviate pressure and moderate prices. 2022 cannot be seen as a normal year, and there are concerns about the momentum of demand into next year. ITIC has estimated that full recovery won't be secured until 2026. Industry and government must adopt a medium-term view and pursue pro-business and pro-tourism policies. Jobs, regional economic balance, and exchequer receipts are dependent on a healthy tourism industry. Thank you. Okay, Owen, thank you very much. I'll now ask Tim from the Irish Hotel Federation to take the floor in your three minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. The Irish Hotels Federation welcomes this opportunity to address the Joint Committee. Our sector is coming out of an exceptionally challenging two years, during which hotels lost over €5 billion Euros in revenue. Government supports, which are very much appreciated, were vital to the survival of many businesses, and we now look forward to recovery and sustainable long-term growth in the supply of important hotel infrastructure within the Irish economy. As outlined in our submission, we have seen a much faster rebound in tourism than anyone previously anticipated. However, due to a combination of factors, there is a significant imbalance at present in supply and demand for hotels in Dublin. On the demand side in April, Dublin had the highest occupancy rate of any city in Europe at 83.6%. 
the average daily rate for a room was 154 euros 31, and that's behind Amsterdam, Rome, and London. The average rate was up 16.5% on April 2019, but comes at a time when hotels are reporting spiralling operating costs, with year-on-year -year increases of 88% in energy, 18% in food and beverage supplies, over 30% in linen services, and 20% in insurance costs. On the supply side, Dublin has 22,492 hotel and guest house rooms. We estimate that 82.4% of these are operating as hotel accommodation at present. The remaining 17.6% of rooms relate to government contracted business and rooms out of service for operational reasons. These supply issues are further compounded by delays in the construction of new capacity due to the pandemic. The, com the combined effect of these exceptional factors is that there are now more nights where occupancy in Dublin exceeds 90% and the last available room rates are quoted at rates in excess of the average. This has given rise to significant levels of media and political commentary and misperceptions around the overall value for money in the market in Dublin, which remains competitive with our European peers. What is often lost in this commentary is that the vast majority of rooms currently sold have been contracted and previously booked well in advance of rates significantly below the last available rates. For the current month, approximately 80% of available rooms were sold in advance of the 1st of June, up from 65% in 2019. This dynamic illustrates that we expect to be a, what, we, what we expect to be a short-term disruption to the market, which is likely to uh, be, resolve itself as pent-up demand eases and additional hotel room stock comes on stream. So, in conclusion, we look forward to discussing these issues with you in further detail and addressing any questions individual members of the committee may have. Thank you very much, Tim. And moving swiftly on, Paul, I'd ask you to take the floor in your three minutes. Uh, Cahirlock, members of the committee, thank you very much for your invitation. As the National Tourism Development Authority, Fulch Ireland's role is to support the long-term sustainable growth of this vitally important industry. Specifically on accommodation, we are responsible for ensuring that accommodation quality standards meet visitor needs. Commercial decisions, such as pricing, are the sole responsibility of business owners. We have no role in the setting of prices in accommodation or in any other tourism business. In this context, I want to provide the members of the committee with our analysis of the current situation. Four years ago, Fulch Ireland advised that Dublin required at least an additional 1,100 more hotel rooms in addition to the 5,000 extra bedrooms that were already in development at that time. The distorting effect of the pandemic makes it too difficult now to robustly analyse the long-term supply versus demand needs, but it is abundantly clear that we still require more hotel rooms to meet the city's diverse needs for short-term accommodation. Hotel occupancy in Dublin is now one of the highest in Europe, driven by a range of factors, some of them short-term. These include deferred business conferences, group tours, concerts, weddings, accommodating asylum seekers and displaced Ukrainian citizens, emergency homeless accommodation, and has been, has been highlighted an exceptionally strong recovery in domestic and overseas tourism. Hotels are just one accommodation type in a situation where all accommodation is in short supply. The excess of demand over supply, combined with the rapidly rising input and wage costs and a staffing and skills shortage, all after two years of ma massive revenue loss, has all created significant upward pressure on market pricing. As has been said, there are just over 2,300 hotel rooms in Dublin. There's another 3,500 that are coming on stream over the next two years. We need these rooms and more. We must have a capital city that can cater for all types of visitors with quality and value choices to suit different budgets. Folge Ireland has been for some years now trying to encourage both the development of and the positive conditions for the development of hotels in Dublin through sharing our evidence-based analysis and through our role as a prescribed body in the planning process. Ireland is not a low-cost destination, but it is seen as a good value destination because consumers have found the quality received is worth the price they have paid. In recent years, our value for money score has been positive and consistent, with about 8% saying they got poor value for money, while 80% reporting they received good value for money. However, early indications suggest that these scores are likely to worsen over the summer. 
Ireland's reputation as a good value destination is something that the industry needs to be very conscious of. If reputation is damaged, it will take time to recover. We continue to share our research with the tourism industry and continue to encourage you to be mindful of not just the revenue of today, but the reputation for tomorrow. In conclusion, as with most challenges, there's also opportunity in this challenge. And the opportunity here is to grow the tourism economy in developing regions. This summer, we will be putting unprecedented levels of marketing support into developing tourism destinations such as Cavan, Monaghan, Louth, Offaly, and many, many others. We are also diverting our support into promoting autumn and winter holidays where more capacity and better value will be available. Thank you very much, Paul. And finally, if I could ask Orla to take the floor. Thank you, Chair. I welcome this opportunity to discuss this important issue with the committee. Tourism is a key part of the economic activity of the country, and in particular it's important because of its reach across the country and into all regions. As the sector rebuilds, it's hoped that tourism in 2022 will reach around two-thirds of the activity level of 2019. As members of the committee will be aware, significant funding supports were put in place throughout the COVID-19 pandemic to keep the tourism sector alive and to support this initial rebuild phase in 2022. However, this initial recovery stage has been unpredictable and is not without its challenges. The final loosening of restrictions only occurred in Ireland from the end of January this year, and the speed and pace of the return of tourism has brought issues for all tourism businesses. There have been increasing numbers of anecdotal reports of excessively high pricing in the hotel sector. Whether this is reflective of the general market or the prices being sought online for last remaining rooms, does not negate the possibility that this could have a negative impact on our reputation as a visitor destination. And it's important that Ireland maintains its reputation as a value for money destination. Value isn't just about the price you pay, it's also about what you get for that price. And Irish businesses have proven before that visitors are attracted back again and recommend Ireland to family and friends. Businesses across the whole tourism ecosystem should consider in the medium and long term in making their decisions around value for money. I would also caution that the strong regrowth this year in Irish tourism should not be assumed to be a baseline for future years, given the high level of pent-up demand and rollover business from 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> we cannot assume straight-line linear growth in future years, and we should be prepared for challenging trading conditions in 2023. If recent years have taught us anything, it is to expect the unexpected. In common with the wider economy, there have been sizable increases in the costs of key inputs such as energy, insurance, and difficulty in recruiting and retaining key skills. These challenges are not unique to Ireland. Indeed, they're shared by many countries and contribute towards higher costs for businesses. And it's important that any discussion would recognize that changing landscape for businesses in terms of the cost challenges. And I know the committee has already discussed the, the skills challenges facing the tourism industry and will be aware of the steps being taken by our colleagues in Fault Ireland to address the issue. It's also clear that there have been changes in the available <coughs> supply of accommodation in hotels due to a range of factors, including staff and the humanitarian need to accommodate people fleeing war in Ukraine. The department has engaged with Fault Ireland, Tourism Ireland, ITIC and the Irish Hotels Federation in order to further understand underlying issues surrounding the recovery of the tourism sector. And we're working with the tourism agencies to identify potential actions such as the reweighting of marketing campaigns to ensure promotional activity is aligned with supply across the year. When we look at the wider economy and the particular set of challenges facing the tourism industry, it's clear that a collective and concerted multi-stakeholder approach to tackling these challenges is required. We all want to see the return of a sustainable and vibrant tourism sector, and the department will continue to work towards that goal. Many thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Orla. Uh, very much appreciate to all our guests here today for your comprehensive statements and for sticking to the time. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So I'm now going to move to my colleagues. Uh, you all have six minutes each for questions and answers. Uh, and I'm going to begin with Senator Shane Castles. Uh, thanks very much, Cahirlock, uh, and thanks to all our witnesses <clears throat> for what we're discussing, which is the, the escalating costs in the, in the sector and how that is being addressed and teasing that out with the the key stakeholders in that area. A quick look just here on my, uh, on my laptop at a website in Dublin tonight, uh, a booking website shows that there's only uh, six properties available. Uh, and there's a room in a hotel where 300 TDs and journalists uh, had gathered just a few weeks ago uh, for a quiz night. 
Uh, and that room is going at the knockdown rate of €797 Euro, uh, tonight. €797. Now, I'm going to Spain uh, next month, and I got return flights uh, yesterday for three people for €731.55. Euro so I'd have €65.45 Euro change for my flights. I'd have enough to buy myself and Chris here a round of drinks in Temple Bar tonight. Now, what I've heard today is that there's been a misrepresentation of this discourse on the issue of pricing and who, you know, in terms of rates and that there's value if you book months in advance. I think everyone here would accept that. What I don't accept, in particular as a sports fan, is if there's a big game in Crow Park or the Aviva or there's a concert in the Tree Arena, the exploitation that can happen in terms of rates going exponentially through the roof for hotels. It is fundamentally wrong. And it's exploiting Irish people. The price of a steak in a restaurant doesn't go from 25 euro to 100 euro the same day as in All Ireland. Doesn't. It stays at 25 euro. But suddenly we have a sector that thinks, well, just because we've got X amount of people, 80,000 people coming into the city, we can exploit that situation. So my questions to Tim, and I'm looking at, at, at Tim, who is a regular contributor here in terms of your conclusion, and your analysis of the situation in terming it as a short-term disruption to the market. Everyone has their own choice of words, Tim, and I accept what you've said. I would say a short-term exp exploitation of the market due to a whole load of scenarios. What I'm asking is maybe pointed to what Paul said, Tim, in terms of the damage to the city and the country and the reputation from a tourism point of view by that going on at the moment. And do you accept that the reputational damage in terms of the pitch to foreign uh, customers and domestic is going to be highly damaged if someone like me can book flights for three people for cheaper than staying tonight in the city? And to Owen, Owen, you talked about the fact that industry and government must adopt a medium-term view and a pro-business and pro-tourism policies. I think the government has very much adopted a pro-business and a pro-tourism policy, which you've acknowledged, one in terms of support, but two in terms of the, the, the ask that was made in terms of that rate to exceed to that to give people a fighting chance, to provide a, a service, given that there were pressures with staff. But that's not being, it's not a two-way street. That's not coming back. There has been pro-business and pro-tourism policies put in place. And so could I ask you, in the terms of a two-way street, where is the buyback for the consumer in that? I might start with you, Owen. Sure, and um, I, I fully accept that the government have been pro-tourism and um, I think they've listened to industry and listened to representative groups that, that we, that, for example, that we have here today and have pursued pro-business and pro-tourism uh, policies during the pandemic and thank God they did because there's 20,000 businesses Absolutely. within uh, the tourism and hospitality sector. It's the biggest indigenous industry, uh, the largest regional employer by some distance and what we're urging, I think, and uh, we, we would urge, I mean, those prices that you mentioned for rooms tonight, um, I, I think are excessive. I, I wouldn't be purchasing them. Um, and I, but I don't think they're reflective of the wider industry. And it's interesting when you said you, you looked online and found six rooms tonight in Dublin. There's 20,000 rooms, or Tim will correct me here, but possibly 22,000 bedrooms in Dublin. So there's only six available. Six properties, six hotels. Six hotels, OK. Well, you know, there's, 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 there's not many rooms available, which I think is a sign that Dublin is full tonight. And I looked, I, I, when I, before I was coming in here, because I, I thought, you know, let's look at what's available. I looked at Saturday night, and there were a, a handful of rooms available. They were actually in around the 200 euro price. Um, I suppose my per, question per, was, Park Owen, Hotel and, and, and Buzz was in terms examples. of your analysis of what you were calling for in terms of a medium term view, are you asking consumers to accept what's pr prevailing at the per present time, and then asking, more importantly, government to accept what's prevailing at the present time uh, in terms of the, the pricing? Well, I, I think the focus on the pricing, if, if it's on last available rooms and they're excessive... I was using they're, that they're, as an excessive yeah, point, okay, and, and, and I accept that's what... They're excessively priced. I, I don't think that is a 
positive reflection on the hotel industry mm -hmm. or the tourism industry. If you look at the broad average rate, which is all we can look at for a particular month, and this is collated by an independent third party source, very credible, very respected, the average rate is about €155, Euro, the last available uh, month in Dublin, which was 16% higher than the same month in 2019. That's a significant jump, undeniably, but that's largely driven by inflationary costs and a supply shortage. Tim, um, I, Tim, I think the government has, has been very supportive. Mm -hmm. I would urge them to continue to be supportive because full recovery of the tourism industry is about three, four years away. This year is unique in many ways. There's all sorts of variables in there, including supply being taken out of the system, including uh, hyperinflationary costs. 2023, for example, is going to be far tougher, far softer. So we need the kind of pro-government, pro pro-tourism uh, policies to be, to be maintained and that includes on the competitiveness front, and it also means on the investment front. Okay, so Tim, on the reputational front that Paul spoke about, um, is that of concern to your members that reputational damage will be done and that bringing in additional cash now to maybe soften the blow for what Owen has talked about, about a softer 2023, is that a strategy? Okay, so just um, maybe I would uh, put a context on this. So I can't comment on individual prices. Uh, similar to other representative bodies, we are subject to certain constraints under competition law. Um, in the interest of consumers, it is essential that businesses set their prices independently. Uh, this is a legal requirement, and therefore we are not in a position to make any comments that would potentially be interpreted as seeking to influence hotel prices. So today, what I'm saying is we're not here to defend prices. But what we wanted to do was to provide some context to what we believe is a misperception in the market, and not a misrepresentation, a misperception in the market about what's happening. And that's why we look at the uh, average room rates for the years. We compare them with other cities, and we compare them with um, you know, previous years, etc. The key challenge for us is that, um, at the moment, Dublin doesn't have enough supply. Mm -hmm. Dublin is a really, really attractive city. There's great value in Dublin, but the problem is, is we've come to a stage where there's going to be uh, nights, particularly for maybe some of these football matches, some of these big concerts, where Dublin hasn't got the capacity to deal with it. And, and uh, there's a challenge around that. Are you finished, Senator Cassis, or not unless you wanted to ask? Just a quick question to, to, to Orla uh, Gleeson from the department. Orla, in respect of, obviously, the, the government and the department have a, a key role in, in, in this as well because we've supported the, the industry. Is it a case that the 9% rate is under pressure because of the hotel pricing issue uh, and maintaining it, is that an uphill battle? And in particular, because there are other aspects and other businesses that avail of this in terms of restaurateurs, theatres, hairdressers, a huge swathe of businesses who, as I said, their prices are not escalating on a daily basis. They are there and they are set. And you can see them on a weekly basis and they remain the same. Is that under threat because of what's happening in, in the wider sector in terms of hotels? Thank you, Senator. Um, I might point to, the, I know the Minister commented on this um, when she was in front of this committee um, two weeks ago. Um, Bernard, you might like to speak Yeah, thanks, Orla. So, so just to confirm in, in terms of what the, the Minister said a couple of weeks ago when she was asked th this very question, Senator, um, she said that all matters would be on the table when, uh, when the government considers the <coughs> issue of a further extension of the, of the VAT rate. Um, and I, I really can't add to what the, what the Minister okay, said. Well, then I'll ask you a different question, Bernard. Can I ask then in terms of the fact that there are seven countries within the EU who have a split rate, Belgium, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Malta, Portugal and Slovakia, and they extrapolate both. They take the restaurants away from the hotels so that they can still benefit from the value. Is that something the department have examined? I'm not asking you for a policy initiative from the point of view of what a minister might do. Is it something the department have examined? Sure. Well, it's, it's certainly something that was considered even going back pre-COVID. There, there was some controversy about this very issue around hotel prices. Um, the advice from the Department of Finance at the time was that it wasn't possible within our current VAT structure and EU rules <coughs> to do that. I've just um, named seven EU countries to do it. Portugal is a, a country that has, it depends on tourism. Sure, and uh, as I say, uh, Senator, uh, that was the advice we got from the Department of Finance at the time. Doesn't really fill me with much hope in terms of just us looking outside the box to make sure that if there's a, a scenario where in the context of this budget, 
a sector that's looking for continued government support, but we're not getting the two-way uh, payback in terms of what consumers are expecting, but others who are playing by the rules, who are not increasing their prices, may suffer. Okay, so and I think that, that is something we have to address. I do not want to see restaurateurs uh, lumped in and they, they get nailed because of what's happening at the current time. Thank you, Senator Cassis. I'll have to move on just to give enough time to everybody. I'm now going to invite um, Deputy Amanda Munster. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, just reading, Mr. Fenn, just reading your um, report that you gi you've given us, um, that you've seen a much faster rebound in tourism than anyone had previously, previously anticipated, resulting in a very strong recovery in demand and that it far exceeded all forecasts. And that's great news, I'm sure you would agree. It is great yes, news, yeah, and I, what's important uh, when you look... No, I just want to, yeah, just that, that in itself, just to acknowledge that that's good news for the sector well, and the industry. So my question will be then, why the extortionate room rates being charged and the price gouging? Again, I'd just go back to say that um, we can't comment on pricing, but we can comment on... But you can on speak it. in general. I mean, you've yeah. given a report today, you've quoted prices in your report from various... Um, Countries, hotel room, average room rates. Of course, you can, you yeah, can comment. Can, yeah, of course, so you can comment. Room rate, you represent the industry, you know, and you're out there when you're looking for supports and VAT reductions and that. So, of course, you can comment. We can comment on the prices that are there as of the average room rates and what's going on in the market. What we can't price do gouging is and extortion room send rates a in general comment because it would you would look quite silly if you're to sit here and not acknowledge the extortionate room rates that have been charged at the moment and the price gouging that's going on within the industry. Okay, so we're not here to defend prices. We're here to try to provide some kind of uh, perspective on what's happening in the market. Um, what we would suggest is, is that the average room rate is competitive and there's 22,500 rooms in Dublin most of those are contracted at rates much lower than these rates that the committee okay, seems to be right. focusing I've on. I heard you say that a, few, a moment ago, right? But I'll just give you an example. Again, you could check this out any day of the week, but um, just this morning there, one night for a room in, Jul in the second week in July, um, Dublin, the cheapest was 379 for one room for one night, no breakfast. 379 euro. Now, four star in Madrid was 120. A four star in Lisbon was 141. Paris, 147. And Amsterdam, 141. Again, extortionate room rates here. Again, what we have to uh, feed back to. But can is, you is justify the that? Can, can you, I mean, I don't know how anybody could justify that, but can you justify that? We are not here to defend individual room rates. We can't comment on the prices that you're talking but about But as there. the industry that you represent, I've just given you a comparison. I can give you more that are actually worse and more embarrassing for you, but I'm talking about the industry that you represent. Can you justify three times more expensive, two and a half times more expensive, when other European hotels are facing the same cost of living crisis that you are here. Can you justify that? Okay, so let's just try and put some perspective on what you're suggesting there. Um, when we compare cities, we look at the average rates across the market. No, I'm talking about from a person, it, sorry, sorry, Mr. Fenn, I'm talking about your average person who's looking to book a room in two, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, right? They're not saying, oh, I wonder how does that compare on the average overall? We're talking about what's on display for people who are looking to get a break or go on holiday. I've given you one example that I don't know. If you're not prepared to, to say that that's unjustifiable, I'll leave that with you. But no, Maybe I, if I could just give you another uh, perspective on this. Um, when you compare different cities, you have to make sure you're comparing like with like in terms of the star classification or whatever. You also, when you say book a... a, a a seat on a flight, and it, maybe you book the early flight, and you're an early mm. person on the flight, and you go and you pick your room or your, your seat on the flight. 
um, and the, the rest of the flight is empty, the chances are you've got a very good uh, price. If you are booking the last two seats in the flight, it's a different price. Would you, now, see, also, would you sorry, see that just, as just price finish, gouging just because it's the last couple of seats? No, maybe if I could finish. Sorry. Right, no, and, and no I'm, just, I'm asking you a question. You, you, I don't also, want you talking down the clock. If Would you consider, right, which you've, because you said here in your statement, um, at weekends and nights when there are major concerts or events, when occupancy in Dublin exceeds 90% and the last available rooms are quoted as rates at rates in excess of the average room rate. Now, that's price gouging. We, stand, we stand over that's the statement. Off, we but that's in your own statement. No, we stand over the statement. So you acknowledge there, that cannot... it goes on, price gouging goes on, and people are charged rip-off rates. That is nothing of the sort. I'm, well, that, that's there in black and white. Yes. I'm saying to you in the context of during the pandemic when your sector was in crisis and people were encouraged to holiday at home and people supported you. And I think it was your cell phone that said, came to the, helped the survival of the industry. And now the minute things are starting to open up, you have the rip off again. You have extortionate room rates being charged and compare, easily compared with other European cities, there's no comparison. You're going to drive people out. The huge reputational damage that you're doing to this country as a value for money destination is vast. And you're not thinking in the long term. You're, you're, you're short term, and I don't know if you're aware that, you know, people are, Tourists, international tourists are well able to compare prices and instantly Ireland will get the reputation as being too expensive. Hotel rooms are just rip-off charges. They're not going to come here. And people, domestic tourism that did support you when you were pleading for, for help and, and support, they're not going to forget. I mean, you, everybody's living in a cost of living crisis. Your families, how is a family here to, you know, a family of, say, four, ever to book a room. And the other thing is, there are other many hotels in quieter places around this country that are offering good value for money and are doing their best, doing all they can to encourage tourism. And here we have these rip-off rates in cities and in Dublin and in other cities. And you come here with no, no plan to tackle it, no plan to make a public statement calling on your, your members to, to be reasonable, to offer value for money, not to rip off the public. Okay, so the first point there is that we always encourage our industry to provide the best quality of product how? and value tell me for how, money. Tell me how, in the current context of rip off rates and extortionate room rates, tell me how you do that and how effective has that been? In terms of our industry, there's about 62,000 uh, yeah, uh, odd hotel yeah, bedrooms yeah. in Ireland. But how do you quality, do that? How do you... Yeah, that's based, do you... that's based on a quality framework that's agreed between the uh, Irish Hotels Federation and Forge Ireland as the National Tourism Development But it's Authority. not working. Over years. But it's, it's not working. Um, it's not working. I've well, just given you examples. Everyone around the room will give you examples. Time to run out, and I have given you a bit of latitude as well, I, okay. so could I ask you to wrap up? Yeah, yeah. you I'm, haven't... I'm trying to answer the question. But so I'm you... asking you, Justin, as how has it worked up to now? It hasn't. Those figures speak for themselves. Whatever it is you're doing hasn't worked. And reading your statement here, it's nearly... It's just defensive, defending. Defending the industry. Defending the sector. Not saying boo about the extortion room rates you're charging. And just in relation to the VAT, the VAT reduction, I mean, you, you seriously would have to question the wisdom of that and the extension until February of next year. And then I think, was it yourselves that were out looking for it to be further extended to 2025? And you, you say that with a straight face. There's nobody, and I don't even think the government are willing to put up with this. Okay, and okay, so we might if, give Tim if you an want me to answer, to I will. Well, I, yeah, if yeah. you answer, okay, yeah. So where, look, where was that VAT rate reduction passed on to customers? The VAT rate, as we look at it, is the right rate um, when compared to other European competitors. So we compete every day of the week for international visitors against other Those countries Those prices in don't Europe. reflect that. Where's if, the VAT rate 
Where is the fast, Deputy fat Deputy rate Sorry, passed on to customers? Not in the price, the room rates. Deputy Munster, could I just ask you to give the witness an opportunity to respond? Because you have it was just, had good, I'm good opportunity. You, yeah. Right, I'll ask the question again. The VAT rate that you received that other sectors didn't because you were crying poverty, right? How was that? When we look at the extortionate room rates, how was that VAT rate passed on to your customers? Okay. The question about the VAT is, if you allow me to uh, um, answer, 9%, the VAT, 9 VAT rate is the right rate for our industry when compared to our competitors across Europe. If we go back to 13.5%, there will only be one other country within Europe that will have a higher rate than us. So we compete every day of the week for international visitors. We attract people from overseas. We have been doing so very successfully. Long. I, have to, I actually have to draw this piece to a close. I have given as much latitude okay, as possible. Okay. I'm trying to be fair uh, across the room. So okay. it is to members to either use their time to ask questions or talk mm -hmm. or give our witnesses an opportunity to respond. So I'll now move on. I'm going to uh, ask Senator Carrie. Sorry, I skipped you by accident. I know you're to replace Deputy Allen and My apologies. Thanks very much, Chair. Welcome, uh, our, our witnesses here today. And I think it's important that everyone acknowledge the significant government support that has been put in place for the industry over the last couple of years. But the reality is that's, that is taxpayers' money that has been put in place. Um, and, you know, we talk about low availability and last minute, etc. And I go back to actually last April when I looked uh, to try and book a room on a Saturday night. Uh, you know, young lad had a rugby match on a, on, a, on a Sunday morning, and we said we'd come up on the cheapest we could get. And that wasn't at last minute. was €600, Euro, and that was at the end of April. So... There's something wrong with the figures that are there, or I, I don't know, but that, that is the reality of when a person is going um, um, to, to, to look for it. And the reality is, as I say, significant supports went into the business. It's different for the likes of Ryanair to charge these extraordinary prices at last minute when you look to book something. I think that the hotel industry has to give something back to the consumer and the taxpayer. And I think it has to stop with these extortionate prices. Just a couple of questions, particularly, and it was mentioned by um, Senator Cassell, is just in relation to when concerts are on, and I suppose a question, do, do concert promoters notify the hotel industry in advance of when a concert is going to be planned? Because it seems to be that as soon as a concert is announced, the hotel prices have nearly gone up in advance of when that nearly concert has been announced to the public domain. Um, and as I say, we see then the extortion of prices um, that are put in place. Just a question. And I suppose in relation to the VAT rate, and it's been, it's been said um, by other members here, you know, like it's going to be very difficult to get support to retain the VAT rate at 9% because of what is happening at the minute. But the reality is that there's significant other activities, restaurants, hairdressers out there that are also on that 9% VAT rate. And I would put that question... Is it, I can't understand if other EU countries can have a split rate. I can't see why we can't have here. And I think that's how serious this has been looked at uh, within, as I say, parliamentary circles and discussions and the people I've been talking to you because of what has happened. So I think the industry really needs to look seriously at this. And I don't think it's fair, Tony, to say that we can't comment. As a federation, the representative bodies for all hotels across the country and I think you have to come out strong and say, this has to stop. Because as an industry, you'll be looking for this committee. And we've been very, very strong as a collective committee of all parties here in supporting the, uh, the industry, in supporting the extension of the VAT rate. But it'd be very, very difficult for us as a committee to give full support if, if the current, if this currently, uh, what is happening currently continues. I might take that, Senator. Um, so, so firstly, um, our industry couldn't have survived the last two years without the government supports, and as my colleagues have said, we're very, very grateful for them. Um, to answer your question, when, when concert promoters announce dates, we have no knowledge of it. So, so that's it, that, just to answer that question. Um, I suppose I, I have two points I, I'd like to raise on it. Um, when a concert is announced in, in Dublin specifically, it has a... a far further impact on the availability of rooms than if, if a concert or a sports event is announced, say, in London, because obviously it's a larger city and they have more hotel room and a hotel stock. Um, the, 
the, the issue that we're dealing with now in Dublin, and as a hotelier working in Dublin for many years, we're dealing with exceptional level of advanced bookings. Okay, we did highlight that uh, in our in our um, paperwork that we submitted to you earlier. Um, and if I can draw your attention to it, um, if, if we take June, we've used June as an example. Um, as we approach June, this in 2022, we had 80% of our business done. So 80% of 44 hotels in Dublin were, 80% of the business was already in the hotels. That was a sample of 44 hotels on an independent company that we use, like Owen has mentioned earlier. In 2019, that was 65%. So already there's pressure on the capacity in Dublin. So that's one factor. The other factor is, as, as Tim has highlighted, we're dealing with reduced availability. So our supply is reduced, <coughs> we've said, by up to 17%. So that's a further issue that we're dealing with as well. So all that, you know, we, we, we also highlighted that, you know, in my, in my hotel, it's 90, I'm 90% full. You know, uh, the city is very, very busy. So that means then it's, it's the last rooms that we're talking about. So those last rooms is what... what people are seeing and and you know to answer your question about you know uh, concerts and events the this pent up demand is huge we're dealing with you know we, we've corporate business on the books that's carried over from 2020 2021 the same with group business that we're that that's on our books so so if you see the, the tour bus that's driving around the country 45 percent of the tour buses that are in our hotels at the moment are are bookings that were made and carried over and deferred from 2020 and 2021. So that's putting an extra pressure on our supply as well because we don't have the space. So all that is, is um, building it so that when you come into the month, you have less rooms that you can sell. So let's say for the example that we gave on our paperwork was that a hotel is 80% business already, so then they only have 20% left. So that means that they'll probably finish the month 94%. So you've got 14% of your availability. That's all you're, you're dealing with. And if you have a concert on a Wednesday, it's going to be very difficult. Either side of that, it's very difficult. The demand mightn't be there to fill that. So you could end up in the month with a 92, 94% occupancy. And that's the problem that we're having. It's total lack of supply. And that's what's causing these last few prices. And, and as a trade association, we can't comment on pricing. Um, but we, you know, I'm not here to defend this excessive pricing either, Senator, and that's important. Yeah, and I think, uh, thank you for your comments, and I think, number one, I think it's probably great that, you know, in one way that we're having this discussion, because two years ago we were having this discussion, we were looking at 2024, 2025 mm -hmm. for the recovery of our tourism yeah. sector, so it's good to see it, but I can't understand, and maybe we need to look at legislation. If a hotel bed on a Saturday night next September is €150 Euro for a night, and then if Bruce Springsteen announced a concert, and that bed then goes to 350 euro. That's not right. And we maybe need to look at legislation that will stop that. If, if, if something is advertised at a certain price, it should stay at that price. It shouldn't just because um, a concert is announced at that and then it's pricing people completely um, out of the market. And I think something needs to, you know, to be done about it. If, if, if the industry wants us to support the extension of the 9%, of the and I know that's something that you... You do want, and I'm involved in the tourism yeah, absolutely. sector yeah. myself. I'm involved in the tourism committee at home, my, my own, my own mm -hmm. county. Um, we, we need it to happen, but we need this needs to be addressed. Thank you very much, Senator Carey. Um, I'll move on now to Deputy Brendan Griffin. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to all of our guests today, and uh, appreciate you taking time out uh, of what is a busy time of the year. For the, uh, for the industry to, to be with us today. Um, I suppose, look, considering the, the issue, and it's, it's one of immense frustration for many people, um, I think it's important that we wouldn't tar everyone with the same brush. Um, I think that's one of the big, um, I think it's one, of, it's, it, it, it's, it's one of the tendencies, I think, um, to, to, to occur when we have this discussion that the entire industry um, across the boards gets gets all painted with the with the one brush, um, and that there aren't um, you know differentiations made between various categories of, of accommodation provider, um, certainly on a geographical basis as well. That those uh, differentiations aren't made as well. I'm a bit of an anorak. I spend a lot of time looking at Booking.com and Travago and 
all those different sites um, just out of interest. Um, not that I'm actually going places, just out of interest, looking at what the prices are. Uh, I have a very exciting life. Um, but, you know, um, certainly I think it's very, very clear to see that there is one particular location in this country where prices are just out of this world, and that's Dublin. Um, there's great value to be got in other parts of Ireland. Uh, I wish that, and I'm probably I should be doing it more, maybe actually pointing out the good news stories uh, where there's really excellent value to be got. Um, even looking at my own constituency again this week, looking at Killarney this week, some really good four-star hotels for less than 150 euro bed and breakfast. Um, it's it's hard to imagine how people can even do that, um, how how they can sell at those prices. But that they're the prices that are available. You'll always have the lad who'll get on to Joe Duffy quoted six thousand euro for a week in a five-star hotel in Killarney. That sort of thing just does nobody any service. Um, I think that's really um, just distorting the argument. Um, one thing I would say is that, look, um, whereas, you know, booking sites and, and these engines are really useful for the industry, it's also a bit of a double-edged sword because sometimes they can throw up some massive anomalies um, and you get these ridiculous prices, you know, um, every so often. But consistently now the Dublin prices are extremely, extremely high. Um, really damaging to our reputation internationally and I think there has to be differentiation made between some of the independently owned hotels and the corporate hotels and I think that's, a, that's the elephant in the room. Uh, there are people who are ruthlessly selling, who are not thinking about next season or the season after and they're ruthlessly selling at enormous prices and yes you, you hear about them, you don't hear about the independent smaller groups who are doing their best and who are keeping prices at very reasonable um, um, limits and um, they don't make the headlines. And I think that needs to be factored into the discussion and we need to be fair here when we're talking about it. But I would say, though, that um, all of us, we, we should all, as an, as an industry and as public reps, we should actually at this stage start naming and shaming those who are abusing the situation. I think it's the only way we can go at this stage because... Um, you know, everyone being tarred with one brush just isn't helping anyone and it's letting those people who are abusing the situation get away. Um, and so I think it's, it's time now to actually individually identifying the abusers of the situation and, and making them public. And I think that's the only way that we're going to deal with this. We can have all the discussions in here. Uh, for We can talk until the cows come home, but until actually we start going out there and, and just identifying the people who are, who are abusing the situation. I think we're, we're going to be going around in circles. Um, just, I'm very keen that we would um, help address some of the costs, at least. Um, in particular, um, energy prices, I'd imagine, uh, are a huge challenge for the sector at the moment. Is there anything, could I ask the IHF representatives here, is there anything, and, and the, the ETIC representatives, is there anything in particular from, from government in relation to costs? Energy, I'm, I'm sure, is a huge one. Um, but other costs as well that, that you feel could be done that isn't being done. Um, could I ask in relation to insurance, have you seen the benefits of reforms in that area actually starting to accrue in relation to premiums being charged um, or is the is, are premiums still increasing or has the rate of increase at least um, slowed and could I ask as well just <clears throat> in relation to the um, a separate matter, but is, is it impacting maybe in terms of rural, the, the cost of rental cars, which is, again, astronomical and I'm getting very much now close to the name and shame territory as well. I think that's the only corrective action I think we can take, far from deregulating and doing an Airbnb, I think, for car rentals. And let's see how, um, you know, the Hertz and the Go cars of this world and, and everyone else who's jumping on the bandwagon and uh, deal with that. Um, but um, could I ask, um, is that impacting on, on rural hotels and uh, accommodation providers? Thanks. So maybe if I would take the piece on the insurance, um, the government are making great progress at the moment in relation to new legislation, um, but we haven't seen any significant reduction in the market yet uh, for the insurance. We have, in fact, members are reporting increases of 20% still. So that, and that's been going on for year after year after year. So insurance is a, is a significant challenge for us. I suppose nobody can really um, do anything about the price of oil out there, but um, hotels are big users of, of energy. The utility costs are significant bills, and maybe if I was to pass on to Denise, she would give you some visibility on what, what kind of 
let's say, implications we're talking about when you see those prices? I, I spoke with two hoteliers in the last week about energy and uh, both uh, down actually in the south of Ireland. One hotelier, his energy bill was 14,000 in March and in April it was 42,000. Another hotelier in Killarney told me that their bill was 5,300 in March and in April it was 11,000. And the exact same use units, so there was no spike in the usage. It was, you know, month on month. So there, there's a huge concern about the spiralling costs that, that our, our members are taking on at the moment. And that, in addition with the huge food and beverage inputs as well are, are increasing all the time um, and then there's a shortage of supply of some goods as well um, so and linen as well is a huge issue deputy um, the price of linen some companies are charging hotels fuel surcharges as well as increasing their costs so so hotels are dealing with spiraling costs that is a huge concern for us as well I might just jump mm -hmm. in briefly on the car hire thing I'll actually, I'll actually pass to Ruth on the car hire thing just, just on, on a general point though I think some of those excessive prices that you mentioned, Deputy, and, and the previous deputies mentioned, particularly in Dublin on, on concert nights or whatever, um, are damaging for the broad tourism industry. Um, and they're not, but they're not reflective of the, of the wider industry. And I think that's something important to state. Uh, the tourism industry does know that, that it's critical that value is retained and maintained. Uh, back in 2006, at the height of the Celtic Tiger, Irish tourism became expensive and it lost its value perception. And then the great financial crash happened, and obviously travel and tourism globally suffered. But Irish tourism took much longer to recover because we had lost value. So we do understand the importance of value. Uh, it is frustrating for us to hear about some of the prices um, that, that you're talking about for those late, last-minute availability rooms. On, on an average par, um, the, the value of a room in Dublin and nationally is still value for money compared to international peers, but that's something that we have to guard very jealously and very carefully. And just a, a quick comment, I'll pass the route now because I'm eating up time. Just the 9% VAT rate is a national VAT rate and it covers all of tourism services. So the idea of sort of punishing the industry for poor behaviour by a handful of hoteliers in Dublin and um, punishing the industry on a national level would, I think, be very damaging to the recovery of Irish tourism as a whole. Yeah, Ruth, do you want to, to talk about say, car I referred incorrectly to Go Car as well. I shouldn't have referred to the truck withdraw that particular remark, but uh, I stand by Hertz because I've looked at Hertz and what they're charging. Just because they can, it's not good enough. It's absolutely, it's, it's economic trees, and I would describe it as what they're doing. We're spending so much money marketing um, experiences like the Wild Atlantic Way internationally, and then people come to Ireland and the likes of Hertz are charging out of this world. They're not, they're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. But um, it is time that we start, I think, to publicly name and shame. But I, I, I referred incorrectly, as I said, to go, I shouldn't have preferred to him. Yeah. It is certainly a challenge for the industry, and certainly in terms of uh, facilitating new business, which was going to be critical given the level of pent-up demand um, for inbound tourism this year, that we had uh, that availability of uh, car rental stock available to us. And unfortunately, because of the lack of stock, it's down by 50% on previous years um, and you know the car industry uh, whom are members of ITIC you know they've made it very clear that their issue is that even if they had tried to to get their hands on additional stock for this year it just wasn't available for all the reasons we know supply chain issues in terms of post-pandemic production um, and just trying to get cars off and into an island destination like Ireland, we have our own issues in around that as well because we have right-hand drive versus yeah. left-hand drive. But to your point in terms of pricing, it, it's not just pricing, but it is availability. I mean, the availability piece in terms of 40% on an average year of our uh, holiday visitors need cars to get around this country. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. It is going to be detrimental I, to the rural I, I, th I think at this stage it's got so bad that we're going to have to do the equivalent of Airbnb for car rental and if someone has a car and they want to make it available we're going to have to find a mechanism for doing that because they're gouging beyond belief mm -hmm. at the moment. It's ab absolutely unbelievable what's going on yeah. and, and it seems to me despite um, the, the, the constraints that they have in terms of supply they're still trying to achieve the same profits yeah. and that's just not right. That's, that not, that's not acceptable and they were well looked after during the pandemic and yet, here they are now, first opportunity, gouge beyond belief, and it's, it's not right, it has to be stopped.
Yeah. Um, if I, I would actually would be grateful to hear Paul's views from a false perspective, because as you know, like you put in a huge amount of work in trying to develop the experiences and develop, um, you know, the, the, the Wild Atlantic Way and other experiences like that, and, um, and yet this is going on. And the other thing as well, Paul, could I just ask, I mean, you know, at the back of the room door in hotels, you'll see the, the prices and you'll see the limits. I mean, there has to be a point at which FALTA intervenes here as well to, 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 to prevent the types of prices that we're seeing being charged um, from actually applying to customers. Is it, what, what, what are your, your, your limitations or what are the extent of your powers there in that regard? Yeah, let, let, me, let me answer the second one first, uh, Deputy, and come back then to the car, rental, uh, the car rental issue. As I said in the opening statement, we, we have no role in, uh, in commercial decisions around pricing. Uh, hotels um, registered accommodation with us must uh, submit a scale of charges. So they, they submit the scale of charges as part of the register and, and, you know, in terms of, and that's what, but we have, that is completely, what they put on that scale of charges is completely up to them. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, hotels and, and other accommodation providers put up a very broad range of scale of charges, you know, in terms of, so it doesn't limit their commercial decision making uh, down the track. So, but we, we have, um, and we have found, those ranges, those scale of charges are so broad what's submitted. Uh, and even when there's concerts on and things like that, we have checked our, um, our hotels staying within the scale of charges. Um, and they are, because the scale of charges that, that, that they've submitted are so broad. So all, all, and those scale of charges need to be prominently displayed. They're no longer required at the back of every bedroom door like they used to be. They're now, they're now displayed generally well, in reception. It's, it's, it's kind of pointless though, is it really? I mean, there's nothing, if, if they put up the scale of charges, yet they decide to, to charge yeah, I think, multiples of that. There's nothing you can do, really, is what you're well, saying. Well, if, if, they, if they go outside of the scale of charges that they've submitted, yeah. uh, then their registration could be at risk, yes. And uh, how in terms do you of, check that, then? I mean, we, we, we check, we spot check um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, on, on, on various occasions, we would spot check and see our, our property staying within the scale of charges. Could, could and we, we've, had no, we've had no incidents yeah. Uh, uh, where we found anyone has gone outside of the scale of charges. Because the scale of charges, are st the maximum price on those scale of charges is set at a very high level to allow for all eventualities. And, uh, yeah, and that's the yeah, thing. Could I advise, have a good look at the corporate groups, <coughs> and could I also ask as well, do you, basically, if someone wants to come in and put €100,000 per night, that, that they're, 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 stop you actually accepting that. that they're, 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 we, we have, we, they, they can put whatever they want on that. Yeah, yeah. we've got no legislative power are they to, doing to that? anything. Are they in putting that. astronomically high prices uh, on the scale of charges? They're, they're, I mean, in terms of, um, I mean, they're, they're, I'm not aware of anything at 100,000 euros. Yeah, or yeah, anything, so but but the charges, but as I say, there, we found they no incidents where they've got. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's, um, and that's that comes from statutory instrument, is it? Or? Uh, that's that's as per the Tourism Tra Traffic Act. Yeah. So that could be something that could be done through SI. I think I think it would be important if I can just say a couple, a couple of quick things. Uh, I think it, you know the core issue here, and we've talked about it. You know, is is the supply of tourism of, of tourism accommodation, and particularly supply in Dublin. And this isn't just the Dublin problem because Dublin is the gateway for Ireland. And if people if people can't get the night in Dublin, then We'll lose the night in Kerry, we'll lose the night in Louth, we'll lose the night in Cavino, we'll lose different nights all around the country in terms of so. And the, the core long term solution here is it is really important that we have supply coming into the market. So I'm not going to ask for pro business policy, I'm going to ask for pro development policy. You know, in terms of if there's actions taken, there's legislation, there's controls and stuff being talked about in this committee today. And my real concern is that will make the problem worse because it will slow down uh, and constrain the amount of supply coming in. It was only in about 2016, I think, when it became profitable to build a hotel room in Dublin again. And we had no development from the financial crash. This is still a hangover from then. We had no new stock being developed while tourism in globally was growing and tourism in Ireland was growing exceptionally well. Uh, and all of the other requirements for short-term accommodation. So whatever actions the committee considers or the government considers and whatever policies, you know, it is really important that we facilitate. And not everybody uh, has been, you know, in terms of has been a strong, and there's been some, you know, unfortunately some voices against the development of hotels in Dublin. 
it is so important to the national tourism economy that we have a pro-development policy to allow more supply and more stock because the core issue with Dublin is that those nights when what Denise was talking about when we're 92 or 94 percent capacity they happen too often in Dublin it only takes a concert or a match or something like that to to push the the, the position of that and the solution to that is more stock is more hotels and in terms of the the policies and if you that's the long-term solution. So in terms of any policies the government yeah. is looking at, I'd say but please make sure that they encourage more stock to come on stream in, in as opposed to though, put off investors. In the meantime, though, Chair, could I, could I ask Tim and Denise in particular to make it very clear to, to your members, to the ones, and you know who they are, to the ones that are abusing the situation, that this is not acceptable. That, that there, there has to be, within the IHF, there has to be action taken here as well. I said the vast majority of people are doing the right thing, and they're, they're you're working under very, very difficult circumstances, coming out of an extremely difficult time. But there has to be within. I think that change has to happen as well. And just because someone can charge doesn't mean they should charge, because the damage is going to be accrued by all of us. And uh, I, I think that's something that you can do arising out of today, uh, because, um, again, it only takes a small few to upset everything. And uh, but what's, what's going you, on at the moment can't continue. It's going to destroy Irish tourism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now ask and invite in uh, Deputy Johnny Mythen into the conversation. Johnny, you're with us online there if you want to. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah. And you have six minutes or there or thereabouts. I'm not doing too well today on the timekeeping, but go ahead. Thanks, Mayor. Look, look I agree with what Brendan said. Most of what Brendan said there, uh, there's, there's serious issues in the car hire and so forth and everything else. But it was just mentioned there uh, during the conversation that, that it was, there was a misperception that the prices were high. I mean, I don't know how to that because speaker after speaker has just said, like, in our own areas, like in my own area, like for August, like for two nights, uh, for one person, it was 460 euro. Um, and then when you go inside to Dublin, it's just phenomenal. Uh, I was just, like, wondering how can, like, the last available rooms be, 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 be so high, you know? And what, what, we're saying this is to start the figures, but that's a fact out there. I mean, I, I was I was talking to a taxi driver the other day. He said I was brought about prices in Dublin, and he just said, "Look, he had, he had four women over from Manchester. They come over a weekend to Dublin, and they gone the way back. They said they'd never come back to Dublin again." I mean, that's the situation on the ground. I mean, people are are, are, are really being being exorbitant prices. They're charging being char charged exorbitant prices. So, like, really, we we have to come to terms like what's worth what. Uh, you know, you might gain. For this year, but the year after and the year after, we're going to suffer. So we really, really must must address that that issue. Uh, just on on um, the department in your briefing notes, you outlined that, that some actions were taken to address staff shortages. I'm just wondering, do you think that that the low wage low wages in this particular industry is contributing to staff shortages? And um, just on board fudge, I just don't know what you know. Have you got a criteria for businesses to use your logo and and you know, can you, or does, does this contain the value of money element? And if not, could this be a way to address the, the overpricing in, in, in other areas as well? Uh, just those two for, for a start. Thank you. Okay, so um, who first, Johnny? Maybe t Tim, is it? Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I was trying to articulate earlier on was that um, the focus on the last available room rates is not telling the full story about what's going on in the market. And what we're trying to articulate here today is that there is significant value out there. And uh, the challenge we have is that because there's a lack of supply, when you get down to those last few rooms, they, you know, they're going to cost a lot more than, than, than one might want. Um, and when you look, say, at Dublin market, if you look out to next October, if you if you plan a trip next October, there's plenty of good value. September, you know, into August. The team, team, what, just sorry, is, is what, why, why, why should they cost so much? Why are they costing so much? It's a supply and demand issue. Okay, but that's and the ripping people here. off. You know, it, it, it's it's you're staying supply and demand, but it's still you know it, if you're a starting person, you're booking that room. We're still paying, being overpriced. It, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Can you not yeah. see that that you know yeah. should be averaged out that that it is doing doing that damage to to your industry? If 
we were to have some kind of price control, I'm not suggesting that that's the way it should be. And if all of a sudden somebody said that the maximum price in Dublin was the average price of 150 euros a night, uh, Dublin probably would have been sold out for June uh, in the middle of May, and there would be no rooms for anybody. So, I mean, just, just try, trying to get to a stage where people understand the difference between um, what is happening in the market and what is um, being articulated around these last available rates. We can't add additional rooms in the short term. We have uh, come through a very challenging time with the financial crash. And as Paul mentioned earlier on, you know, it was about 2017 or 18 before anybody could actually um, build a room in Dublin um, because it was cheaper to buy distressed assets. We're now in a situation where uh, when we came out of, um, or when we went into um, the COVID pandemic, there was maybe five, six, seven thousand rooms, whatever, um, in the pipeline, and they didn't materialize. So we you know, were down 3,000 rooms right at the end, at the start of this year. Now we're hoping that by the end of 2024, that by, there might be another 5,000 rooms coming into the market, and maybe more again as we go forward. But that's the real issue here. It's about the fact that we don't have the availability. And when, when some people well, also compare in, us... In I, would say, I would say that, that, in fairness, the real issue is the price. And that's the real issue. It doesn't make a difference, you know, what, what for their last rooms or first rooms or whatever. It really means, like, if a person books a room and it's, it's as, as you said before, up to 700 euros, you know, like, uh, you can go to Spain for that for, for yeah. And again, what we're saying is that, look, we can't make a comment on individual prices, um, and that's a challenge for us. Um, you know, what, what but, but, said, that what the, what the I know you can't make a comment on individual prices. I, we understand that, right? But the fact you've got to recognise the damage and reputations that the you know, tourist reputation is doing, because those women went back, and, you know, when you go on a holiday, someone comes back and says, how did you get on? How did things go? Oh, you had a fantastic time, had this and that, the other. Those people are not going to say that. They're going to say, listen, do not go there. So, look, we appreciate the comments that are being made on short-term and long-term pricing policies. Um, and the, the challenge at the moment is, is that pricing, whatever is there, whether it's good or bad, has led to the fact that Dublin is full. There's no more rooms available, by and large. In June, this current year, uh, we would expect that occupancy will get to something in the order of 92% on average. There's plenty of nights where you can't sell all your property, all your rooms, and the day you don't sell your room, you can't sell it the following night. Uh, so it is absolutely uh, jam full for this month. It'll and just, just just said in your opening statement that the full recovery won't be secured until 2026. And what is this based on? And is there empirical figures to state that? Because uh, this year is obviously going to be a huge I'm, bumper year for, for you. I'm sorry, uh, Deputy, I missed that, that question. Oh, sorry, uh, you said you don't want me to say that, that the full recovery won't be secured until 2026. That's um, I just wonder what's based on or what empirical figures you have. Yeah. Well, because this year, this year is definitely a huge Can I pass it to year. my colleague here? That's an ITIC um, estimate. Um, hello, Deputy. That's, um, that's an estimate that ITIC, the Irish Tourism Industry Confederation, uh, have come up with. Uh, we look at it every few months and we recalibrated it relatively recently. It's actually uh, overseas tourist numbers to Ireland. We estimate won't have recovered to 2019 levels, which was the previous peak, until about 2026, hopefully sooner. But I, I still think there's about three or four years uh, to go. What we're seeing this year is very strong demand for a variety of reasons. One is pent up demand. So people, you know, post-COVID just want to get out there and enjoy their holiday experience. One is deferred demand. So there was an awful lot of business uh, on the books in, say, 2020 and 2021 that, that, that ended up being transferred into this year. And obviously, there's a lot of sort of consumer savings as a result of, of COVID. So we're seeing, if you like, an artificial level of demand this year. We also have to remember that supply of hotel rooms in Dublin, for example, is down 15, 17 percent for a variety of reasons. I think next year, 2023, is going to be actually much softer and much more difficult because all that pent-up demand and that deferred demand won't be there and, and literally 
uh, the clock will go back to zero on January 1st and we're going to have to win all the business again. So in terms of overseas tourism recovery, it is three, four years away. But incumbent on that is Ireland remaining a really attractive holiday destination, one that offers really good experiences and one that offers really good value for money. So, you know, the, the, this idea of, 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 of late availability, high priced rooms in Dublin, uh, we have to make sure that we don't, if you like, lose the bigger picture, which is jobs right around the country, the biggest regional employer, um, Deputy Griffin, one in six jobs in, in Killarney is tourism related. So we can't, we can't if you like, uh, um, damage the industry uh, with, with, with short term um, um, approaches. And that applies to both uh, hoteliers who shouldn't be adopting a short term approach, nor, nor should it be um, um, the legislative bodies. Thank you. Thank you. And just in the department, um, I just asked in, the, in your briefing note, you outlined some actions being taken to address staff shortages. I was just wondering, what do you think of that? Is it a factor of low wages? and probably long hours are contributing to staff shortages. Thank you. In terms of uh, that particular issue, Fault Ireland um, carried out an extensive piece of research last year, probably the most extensive piece of research in this area, um, and they did find that pay was, was an issue, um, but other significant issues included, um, uh, as, as you referred to, flexibility, uh, certainty regarding uh, rosters, family-friendly hours, etc. Um, in terms of good news, the most recent research uh, through Fodge's barometer points to 71% of employers increasing pay, 69% uh, of employers offering, um, you know, more flexible arrangements for for their staff. Um, but I, we'd have to acknowledge it's still a very difficult situation. It's a difficult situation across the economy in terms of uh, recruitment right now. Fodge, you may wish to comment on. The initiatives they have underway, they have an extensive program to support employers in terms of uh, the issues they're facing. And had you one last question, Johnny, for somebody else? No, for no that was it. That was it. Just that was it. maybe Borough Falls should ask that question. Or Fault sorry, Fault Ireland. Fault Ireland, yeah. Thank, th thanks, thanks, Deputy. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose just, just, I mean, I think Berners outlined that there is significant progress being made in terms of how the industry are working to try and uh, to try and attract staff and, uh, and and address some of the insights around covering that research uh, and also in terms of our, our program around supporting the industry in terms of recruitment campaigns and and, and uh, you know a new empl excellent employment program we'll be launching later this year are, are all are all in train and uh, and, and supporting but as Bernard said it's, it stays very difficult um, you know with regards to you know we you, you do question with regards to the fall Ireland logos etc and uh, you know that we make those available to to all businesses in the sector uh, to, um, uh, to, to in order to help promote uh, to, for them to help promote, promote their businesses and I think that's the right thing uh, that's 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 the right thing to do and uh, you know as and particularly I suppose for accommodation businesses that are registered with, with us um, you know in terms of they have uh, you know in terms of that they are properly registered accommodation businesses and therefore should be uh, should be afforded the rights to use uh, to, to, to use our logos if I may just come back because I'm conscious of an important issue that was raised by deputy Griffin around car rental sector uh, and I think this is this is actually you know strategically it's one that I'm most worried about um, because the people who about, I think uh, you know people who rent cars in Ireland spend longer in Ireland they spend more money in Ireland they visit places like Wexford Kerry all around the country uh, and they require rental cars to do that and the, the the core economics of the rental car business in Ireland and the nature of the tourism business in Ireland means it needs to be economically advantage uh, uh, economically work for rental car companies to buy extra cars in March and then sell them as second-hand cars later in the season and we've submitted a report into, into uh, the department last year, into the Department of Finance, showing that some of the actions around how VAT and VRT are treated are, are making it exceptionally more expensive in Ireland to operate that model uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of being able to buy cars in, in March and sell them in October. And the industry have certainly fed back to me that, you know, in terms of, unless there is a change in the taxation model to facilitate that when stock becomes available, it's still not going to be economical for car rental companies to significantly increase their seasonal stock. And that will damage tourism in Ireland uh, on, an, on an ongoing basis. So it's really important that, you know, in terms of we have the right 
policy to, to suit the tourism needs of rental cars because once again it's a supply issue and the more supply the more competition the more competition the better value Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Deputy Mytham, as well, for your line of question. I'm now going to call on Deputy Christopher O'Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. And I'd first like to uh, come to the Irish Hotels Federation. Um, just a quick question first up. Ballpark, uh, rough figure, how many um, hotels in and around the Dublin area are members of the Irish Hotels Federation? Do you have an idea? Most. Most hotels. So there's... It would be fair to say, it would be a, a, a good guess, a fair guess, that these prices that we're all referring to, the 400, 500, 600, Deputy Castle referred to 700 euro uh, per night. We've all been going onto the website, I think every TD and Senator, before we came on here, we went to check and compare prices. It would be fair to say uh, that those prices are being charged by members uh, that are, are hotels that are members of the Irish Hotels Federation. Possibly. Yeah. It's possible, yeah. So can we, can you not, Tim, just try to rein them in? Just try to rein in those excessive prices, those five, six, seven hundred euro. Uh, you know, just, just put out an instruction, a memo, a, a request to members for the sake of the reputation of, of the hospitality sector in Irish. Can you not ask them to rein, rein in those extortionate prices? We can communicate to members uh, the message from the committee, maybe here today. Hotels Federation cannot send a message to the market on price. We okay. will not break the law. Denise, maybe, I know Tim, Tim constantly says that he can't comment on or, or, or communicate with members in relation to these extortion prices. Can you, as president, um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, unfortunately I, I, I wouldn't be in a position to do that either and, and, and it's very challenging you know and, and as we said we're not here to, to to condone the excessive pricing but you know the point really that um deputy that we want to get across is that there is you know it's it's the supply issue at the moment and you know I you um, deputy Mythen just mentioned there just about events and 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 this year is a year like no other, and you know I know that Owen has mentioned it, and, and it's really important that we don't lose sight of that. You know, um, in 2019 there was seven concerts in the three arena. There's 13 this year. There's two concerts. There's just so many events, yeah, and there's I, I don't, I don't demand. quite buy the supply issue, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a second. But you can see why us uh, TDs and senators and members of this committee are very frustrated because. We, we welcome discussions with the IHF and, and members of the IHF during the pandemic when we were calling for extension of the EWSS, when we were calling for a restart grants, when we were calling for Chris supports, when we were calling for a reduction of the VAT. And, and we did that, and we went and we asked for that. And all we're asking for is a gesture in return that some type of communication goes to members of the IHF in the Dublin area, because this is yeah. where it's happening, who are charging extortionate prices, just to rein it in and to stop it, because we're, we're doing severe reputational damage not just to Ireland as a country but it's I think completely unfair on hotels in the regional areas I'm from West Cork and again going on to the uh, um, booking site just to do a quick comparison in hotels where and in a region where there is 80 to 90 percent occupancy occupancy and where they're still facing the same challenges in terms of increase in prices you were getting in Skull for example 130 euro Baltimore 130 euro Bantry, 130, or these are all really popular tourist destinations. Kinsale, slightly higher, 190. Clan, 150. And these are all last um, available room prices. So that doesn't explain, this supply and demand issue doesn't explain the five, six, 700 euro. Uh, and they're facing the, the same cost. So can you at least accept the reputational damage? Because I haven't quite heard, um, particularly from the IHF, a comment on the reputational damage that these prices that have been charged in Dublin are doing to Ireland as a country and to those regions like West Cork who aren't charging extortionate prices. Again, we just come back to the um, comment that we made earlier. The average room rate in Dublin at 150 euros odd in April um, is competitive when compared to other cities in Europe. The challenge we have, which is different to other cities, is we don't have the same stock levels as they have. We have much higher occupancy rates than they have. If they had the same high occupancy rates that we have, they may, may have some of the issues that we're now dealing with here today. That, 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 and that's fine to talk about the average, but it's those headline 
um, room costs is that's what's going to grab people's attention and that's what's but doing the reputation of damage and, and um, Paul referred to it earlier that we're, all, we're going to expect a de deterioration in the uh, how people view Ireland in terms of its value for money. He said it in, in um, uh, response earlier in his opening statement. So, I mean, Owen, you, you referenced um, uh, increasing costs in hotels there. Uh, you mentioned the West Cork Hotel. Um, I think I know the hotel that we're talking about where food was up by 20%, linen up by 40%, insurance up by 25%. Um, you know, ESB has doubled. Yet, they're not price gouging. That hotel, I can tell you, you can get uh, a, a room for 150 euro, not the five, six, seven hundred euro. So this is Dublin hotels doing significant reputational damage, which is going to have an impact on areas like West Cork. And it's a double whammy if you're from West Cork because the hotel sector and the hospitality sector, which have increased their prices in line with energy and, and, and the cost of doing business, but they're, they're going to um, experience reputational damage. And then it's the punter from West Cork who's going up to the gig or going up to the match who's going to have to pay these five, six, seven hundred euro prices. So can you understand how it's, this has to stop? We absolutely accept what you're saying. Um, um, the challenge we have is around whether we can control price or do anything to control price. What has to happen in uh, Dublin is we have to have sustainable growth of uh, capacity and that's the core uh, issue for us. Dublin needs to grow and then the stock of hotel rooms needs to grow so that we can actually um, um, cater for the demand that's out there. Uh, and that's the most important part of this. If we do any, um, say, short-term policy changes that will damage the potential for supply of room stock, that's not going to uh, fix this problem at all. Very briefly, so last question. Do you, do you accept that this, these extortion prices in the Dublin area are doing reputational damage and yeah. unequal reputational damage to, to the regions and places yeah. like West Cork? Okay, what we're trying to say about that is that the focus on the last available rates is very risky because that in itself creates a reputational damage. What we're trying to say here today is that it is not reflective of what's happening in the total market. Because when you have 22,500 rooms, uh, maybe we should have 42,000 rooms, who knows? The, the, chan the, the challenge is, is that when the media and the political commentary is focusing in on the last 500 rooms or whatever it is, maybe 200 rooms, that's the challenge. And that's where you end up having serious reputational damage, and we will certainly concur with that. And Deputy, we will go back to our members uh, with, with your feedback, absolutely. That's absolutely vital. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy O'Sullivan. I'm now going to um, give the floor to Senator Malcolm Byrne. Uh, and uh, thanks to our, our witnesses. I know that we've, we've engaged with quite a number of you on, on, on different uh, issues um, over the last year. And I think all of us are interested in having a well-respected, good value um, tourist industry. And I, I, I would echo a lot of Chris's concerns and because particularly members of this committee, you know, within our own parliamentary parties and elsewhere, went out on a limb during the COVID period and made specific arguments uh, to support those in the hospitality sector, particularly those of us on the government backbenches. Um, let me just say it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult, and I don't think it is justifiable for the hotel sector uh, that the 9% VAT rate can continue. Because frankly, uh, quite a number of hotels uh, are now causing serious reputational damage uh, to Ireland's tourism uh, industry. And I don't think, you know, reflecting it back to your members, I think, as, as, as Chris said, you know, we want that message to go back very strongly. Uh, and I, I heard, you know, what Owen said and everything about rising costs, but every business is facing rising costs. Um, but we know that not every business uh, is increasing their costs at the level that we see some of the hotels, particularly the Dublin hotels, are doing it. And some hotels, and I know hotels in Wexford, who, are, who continue to be good value for money. Um, and yet what we are seeing is, um, by some hotels in Dublin, it is price gouging. Um, I, I noticed that you, you mentioned that in April, um, that the average uh, hotel price in Dublin was 155 euro. What do you reckon the average hotel price will be for May and June? are that, that um, May could be 177-ish, uh, 75, 77. 
which would represent about a 15% a, a increase on the equivalent amount back in 2019. But we don't have, I mean, that's just a okay, that, that's, speculation. That's a guess. Okay, and I, I do get your point about, you know, last minute booking and so on, and I, I totally understand that, and colleagues, you know, quoted from that. So let's say I was to look at booking a hotel um, in Dublin now for three months' time. Let's say I was to look at the 15th of uh, September. It's a Thursday night. What do you expect I should be paying um, for an average hotel in, in Dublin in about three months' time? I had a look at this myself uh, yesterday, and um, I just said to myself, where is this going to be in a few months' time? So I went to October, I went to September, I went to uh, August, I went to July. And um, without looking for the cheapest room, I was you know, able to find pretty um, easily um, in October something between 100 and 110. When I went to, came back to September, it was 110 to 120. Uh, when I came back to um, uh, August, then it went to 130, 140. When I came back to July, 140, 50. And when I came back to um, June, then it was just a, a real challenge because of the, the fact that we were... Well, all, well we were I, I accept it's last minute, but, but I, I, I happened to look, because I, I knew you know the focus was going to be... I, I looked at the 15th of September. It's a Thursday. It's not a supply issue, because there were over 120 properties available in Dublin across the range of the booking sites, and I went onto some of their own... Uh, sites as well. When you exclude, and there were some very good value B and Bs in some hotels, um, but most of the hotels were charging up over 190 euro. And on, on my average, when you exclude um, B and Bs and hostels, uh, you're talking about an average hotel charging about 220, and that's for three months out. Uh, so I, I don't accept, as Chris said, that, that it's entirely uh, a supply issue. There is a supply problem. I'll, I'll, I'll come to it, and I do get. That you know you can't you can't be involved in telling the market what to do or, or, or you know any sort of price fixing, but you can send a very clear message. During lockdown, um, the the Vintners Federation and the LVA sent out a very clear message to their members. You know you need to have respect for your customers, and nobody should be breaking the COVID rules. All we're asking is we're not asking you to price fix, but we're asking you to say that those minority of hotels who are doing damage to the entire tourism sector, not just to other hotels, uh, that, that they, 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 they need to cop on, frankly, um, because it is having reputation damage. And I know, you know Paul mentioned around the, uh, the survey, um, like we have our own surveys in terms of listening to what people are saying. It's not just tourists, it's commercial travelers uh, who are coming to us and are talking about um, the costs now uh, um, um, for business. Uh, and, and, and I have to say, you know, that, that those hotels that are causing that damage, um, you know, it, 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 it's going to be very difficult for us to go out and to continue to argue for supports, uh, you know, for the sector, which we want to do, um, when, quite frankly, some of your members are not, are not playing, playing ball. I, I might move on, if, if I may, onto the supply side, because I think the, the, the points have kind of been, been well made. Could, could we maybe look at, and I, I, um, I'm, I'm quite interested in terms of Paul's point around, let's talk about the outlook for 2023. We're talking about a certain number of beds becoming un, uh, available. So, so maybe, Paul, can you kind of sketch out where you see us going in terms of on the supply side? There's, uh, there's, uh, thank you, thank you, Senator. There, there's there's uh, currently 22,300 registered rooms in Dublin, uh, registered with Falch Ireland. Um, there is another, between this year and next year, the pipeline currently is an, an additional 3,500 rooms coming on stream. So, so that's a significant, uh, you know, that's a 10 to 15 percent increase in the number of rooms. They're desperately needed, but it's not enough. We will, we will long term, we will need more. Uh, uh, and in terms of, we, we've, we've said that time and time again. Now, but, it, but it is a four to five year kind of time frame from when you kind of start the process to when you open, open your hotel rooms. Uh, sometimes shorter if it's extensions and stuff like that, but but generally that's kind of the timeline, and it's really important, I suppose, that you know in terms of that uh, that that the, the the approach that's taken facilitates that long-term development, and that's around that that's around looking at costs, it's around giving business certainty, etc., and it's and it's around it, making sure that they can. Uh, that, they, that the developers who are looking at investing in that and the investment companies looking at investing in that can see that they can get a good return in Dublin 
which is a higher cost economy. It costs more to build a hotel in Dublin than almost anywhere else. It costs more to get money to build a hotel in Ireland than almost anywhere else in Europe. We are a high cost economy. So we've got to make sure that the, the, those investors can get a return on investment because you're, you're absolutely right that it is, it's not just about tourism. It's about, it's about business. It's about multinationals being able to, to, to uh, have their staff come and forwards, forwards and backwards uh, to Ireland. It's all of the other community needs uh, that, that, that are serviced. And there is a significant portion of the accommodation. And I did say you know, to this committee only back in, in, in April, you know, in terms of that, you know, that housing, uh, housing displaced citizens and asylum seekers in short-term accommodation is not good for them and it's not good for tourism. Mm. And as Tim outlined, you know, after 17% of the accommodation stock has come out of Dublin uh, to serve that purpose for, for very, very valid reasons mm. and, and really important humanitarian reasons. But that, this, what we're seeing now is some of the how it's not good for tourism. And that's just one of those consequences, uh, one of those unattended consequences that's, that, 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 that's, that, that's happening. So, you know, in terms of there is more supply coming on, we do need more supply. I suppose the one thing I know people are talking about, the VAT rate, et cetera, you know, investors are, are, are looking at that. And, and I, I certainly think, you know, a, an increase in the VAT rate from what is in line with, with the European average and competitors that we're dealing with, an increase from that is not going to, if that goes higher, that's not going to encourage more developers to come in. It's only going to put off developers. In the current context of the current supply, of the current supply constraint that we have, you know, the, all, the, the likelihood is that, because once again it comes down to competition, the likelihood is any VAT increase isn't going to bring prices down. It's only going to put them up, um, you know, in terms of, so we've got to be, Realistic. It's also really important, as Owen made the point around, you know, the the the, the tourism economy. The revenue in hotels in Dublin only represents 15% of the tourism economy. The other 85% of the tourism economy is outside uh, is revenue outside of of hotels in Dublin. So really important that you know blunt instruments aren't used. That you know to you know in terms of that that uh, that, that will impact you know, towns and villages and businesses and viability. And that's before you even get the hairdressers and all those other services that are, that are, uh, that are not connected to, uh, that, are, that are not connected. So, you know, it is important that we keep that, we get the, the real, and this is, this I suppose is the, this is the core issue, you know, in terms of easy to go for the short term fixes here, but it is about building supply and it is about facilitating and creating the conditions that will bring more investment and more hotels in because it's really important as well that this is the you know in terms of full hotels okay it is really challenging when you have those high prices and stuff like that but there are people working in shops in cafes in restaurants in bars all throughout Dublin that are delighted the hotels are full because the office workers the offices are not full Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really important that we don't lose sight of that broader economy that, you know, in terms of, you know, having, having full hotels does have a benefit to the wider economy, uh, you know, in terms of we, we, we wouldn't like them to be as full as they are. We'd prefer them to be a little bit emptier so there's more competition, there's more, there's more price competitiveness in, in, in market. But, you know, in terms of that it is really important that we, that we bear in mind that positive economic benefit that's out of that. Ma'am, and, and just a final point, which is that, Paul, and I, I, I do think, by the way, that it's ironic that um, some politicians and political parties who object to hotels being built now kind of complain about a scarcity of, of, of hotel spaces. Um, but are there, are there other planning measures that you think would help in terms of assisting on the supply side? I mean, from what you were hearing um, uh, from developers, are there specific planning measures uh, or any questions? I mean, I, I know I'm certainly hearing around, you know, the length of time if something goes to board Planola and so on, but are there other specific measures that we could take? Yes, so cer certainly the length of time, you know, in terms of that, that uh, look, I have, to, I have to preface this by saying I'm, I'm not a planning expert uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so all I, can, all I can feedback is what developers and, and the industry have told me kind of thing. And they say that the length of time of planning in Ireland is longer than other, than, than, than other destinations they might be building hotels in. And that, and that does put them off because there's, time is money. So there's, there's, there's a cost involved in that and that is a factor. So in terms of, you know, uh, obviously anything, and I know there's lots of people who work incredibly hard in, 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 in local authorities and in board plan all, all around, you know, 
on, on all these things, so I don't want anything to be critical of them, you know, in terms of, but the length of time of planning is certainly one of the issues that, it, that is raised. Uh, I suppose in terms of, the, I know the availability of sites uh, is one of the key things that is holding back hotel development in Dublin in terms of, you know, that's one of the things you said, look, if there was more sites available, um, you know, but I mean, look, you know, we're, 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 it's, Dublin is not a green field, it's a built city, you know, we, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that, that, is a, that is a real challenge, but, and, and I think so, I think the question is to, you know, to the planners, is there anything more that can be done in terms of more availability of sites, more, uh, you know, perhaps easing of height restrictions in more areas, etc., because, you know, if you can if you can put if you can put a, a seven floor hotel instead of a six floor hotel, that's that's a bunch of extra rooms that don't cost you that much extra to build, but actually add a lot to the to the capacity of, of the room stock in Dublin. So you know, things like that should all be be looked at. But as I say, I'm no expert there. But I think it is about I think that you know that's the right question to be asking around how we facilitate that development. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, Sandra Byrne. Thanks to all my colleagues. So, folks, it comes to me, and look at, I think we have trashed through a lot of the issues here today, and I just, I suppose, would have to agree very much, obviously, with my colleagues, but in particular, um, what Deputy O'Sullivan had to say, because I'm obviously looking at it from the perspective of a border county and a border region, and I'm thinking of Cavan Mullen, which is not West Cork, um, and I know the hotels and the hoteliers and the restaurants and the pubs would only give their right arm to have the problem that exists in Dublin. And I suppose I would have to concur with my colleagues, Tim, in saying that it really isn't good enough to say that the political perspective or the public commentary on this has been hugely negative around the vastly expensive, short, small number of rooms that are left. I think the point that people are trying to get to here is, you know, why, when there is that small number of rooms that should be available and obviously are available, but at a rate that is beyond most people's reach, that they're not at the same rate as their other rooms are sold at on the very same night. And I think that's what is upsetting people most. I would go back to, to Paul, um, you know, you're so right. Dublin is the gateway to the rest of the country here. And if we don't, if we can't get, if people can't get into this country and you know, if they have nowhere to stay, they're not going to come, and that has a huge effect regionally right across uh, the country. Um, I suppose I, I take your point, Paul. I think you're the one person who's come here today with very tangible solutions to this, and that's what we should be based on here is focused on solution. Uh, and I would thank you for your, your uh, contribution there, particularly with Senator Byrne in terms of the supply issue and all of that. Um, the car rental piece is something again, and again, Paul, you're absolutely right, if, if people can't rent cars, and we've heard about this weeks ago, uh, and, and, it's, and, the, and the problem still persists, which is really disappointing to hear, you know, if people, if they have the car, they can stay, they can stay longer, they can go further afield, two counties like Cavan, Monaghan, and, and way beyond that. Um, I suppose, Paul, I'd just maybe like to go back to you and just your final thoughts on this. You know, if there is this juggernaut, if you like, here, uh, and I would just refer maybe a little bit to, to Real, Will Goodbody he did a, a, an interesting package last night on RTE where he actually spoke to some of the tourists on the streets of Dublin last night. I think they were coming out of the Guinness storehouse. Americans who had resorted to stay in Airbnb because they couldn't, not that they couldn't find a room, but they couldn't find an affordable room in Dublin city centre. So... You know, where is the incentive for them to come to the country in the first place or go beyond that? You could argue there's a big incentive to get out of Dublin very, very quickly because you will get value for money beyond that. But I suppose, Paul, I suppose just to give you a final opportunity just to kind of um, expand upon that idea. I mean, the impact yeah. that that is having is catastrophic, really, uh, across the country when they can't get into the country in the first place to maybe get their first overnight or their first couple of nights. Everybody wants to visit the capital city of a small island. Let's be honest here, we're a small island. We're not the United States of America, and we want people to come to this country. Yeah, I think, I think first of all, you know, it is important to note that, you know, in terms of the overseas, the overseas visitor plans their trip months and months in advance. In some cases, actually, as has been pointed out, we've got an awful lot of business that was planned years in advance now because it's 2020 and 2021 business rolling over. And it's, and it's rolling over generally, you know, at the rates that were agreed then. And it is important to, to, to recognise that, you know, in terms of those rates were agreed uh, with, the, with those businesses well before the significant costs increase come in, you know, in terms of so, you know, when, when Denise and Tim talk about, you know, uh, you know, 80% uh, of June business being booked, a, a good chunk of that was booked 
in 2019 for 2020 at prices that were agreed long before business. And business have to absorb all the costs, not just on the rooms they're selling today, but on all of the rooms that, uh, that, 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 that they've sold. And, and there's been, you know, uh, so, so that, that, that is a factor. But it is important. So, so th this issue of the last available room, you know, in terms of it impacts you know, it, it, its impact on international visitors is a lot less than uh, than, it, than, its, than its impact on you know someone coming up for the match because their team just qualified for the next round of of the uh, of, of the All Ireland or whatever, because the vast majority of international business is booked well in advance and is booked at rates. And obviously, the visitor won't come if you know the visitor is is looking at the rates and is deciding right, am I willing to pay that or not willing to pay that. And you know, in terms of we have, we have a, one of the strongest recoveries uh, in, in tourism. I think, and the industry need to be given great credit for their work and their resilience uh, in, in terms of their their efforts and the stresses and the strains that the industry have been under in order to, to deliver this recovery and bring back as much employment as quickly as they can. So. And that's across the whole tourism industry. So we have this strong recovery, and that's obviously been driven by people who are happy and felt they were getting value for the prices that were being that, that, that are being paid. And you know, in terms of and but it is important that you know, in terms of that we have we retain we retain that value and retain those prices because what people pay and what people see uh, in terms of when they go to look to book is what's going to be the ultimate perception of value. And, and you know now people are looking at you know where they're going to go for in in quarter four of this year internationally that's what they're looking at now and you know in terms of so and there is value there uh, in that regard so you know and I think it is important to know that the, the, the year is not the three months of the summer the year is the full twelve months and businesses I think so have to Paul, to be honest, up to now we've been hearing that we can expect the prices in hotels around Dublin specifically won't go that much down towards the end of the year. Um, I, I think it is very, we, we are, I mean, the one thing that, that as, as Tim alluded to, the one thing that hoteliers are very aware of is that they can't sell last night's room tomorrow. It's gone. So, you know, in terms of the, the, the they are very, they are very acute at adjusting the price to fill their rooms and there's no revenue in an unsold room. So hoteliers are very, very quickly, if they're not selling the rooms, they will adjust their prices accordingly. And we are certainly, the one thing that's really important to stress is that because so much of the business that's happening now is deferred business, that could be deferred holidays, it could be weddings that have been postponed, it could be business trips and conferences that have been, that have been postponed that are pent up. Because so much, we're in incredibly uncertain times. And although it's looking rosy now for the next few months, you know, in terms of there's a lot of concern around quarter four of this year, a lot of concern around next year's booking because it's just so uncertain. Uh, and I think in terms of when you look at the pricing that's available outwards into it, generally across the country, that, that is kind of reflected uh, in that. But I think the core issue of, of Dublin, it, it won't be as competitive because we don't have the supply. We still need more and more supply. Uh, and we need, you know, in terms of as much of the tourism accommodation stock back into tourism uh, from a tourism point of view, as soon as, as, as it can come. One final question, Paul, and you're brilliant on your facts. In terms of your vision, and I know you talked about 3,500 extra beds coming back into the system as in being planned, not back into the system, but extra mm. capacity. Where do you think we need to actually be aiming to in the next 12 months? Uh, I, Is I, it, I, I know you I, said I, that, yeah. that, that that's a figure. It may not be enough. If you were to take a, an educated, informed guess of where we actually should be aiming at, I mean, I, I, to be honest, it is so uncertain. I, could, I said back, back in 29, back in 2018, 2019, we had said that you know there was a pipeline of 5,000, and we had said we need an extra thousand, 1,100 on top of that from from our analysis. It, it has got so unpredictable. I think it it, it, it really won't be because there's, there's there's no point in predicting what hotels we need next year. You know, in terms of what rooms we need next year, because nothing can happen with that. What we've got to be doing is predicting what rooms do we need in five years' time, and and working as fast as we can to get there, uh, because that's how long it takes uh, to, uh, to to open up the rooms. So, you know, in terms of I think 
that that's we have to take that long term view. And I know that's kind of it feels like a long way away, um, but we have to take that long term view and you know kind of do everything we can to support and speed up and facilitate the development uh, of hotels because if not. There just won't be the room, regardless of the price, there won't be the rooms in Dublin to support the visitor to come to go to Cavan, to go to Wexford, to go to Kerry. You know, so regardless of what price the hotels are at, the, the trends on global tourism are that it won't be the price stopping them, it'll just be the lack of room stopping them. Mm -hmm. You know, so we need the supply desperately. And in turn, that would maybe push the prices up further, those last few remaining rooms, yeah. Tim, that you were talking about. Can I just ask you, Tim, if you could comment, one, one final comment in your uh, presentation here today. You talked about the spiring operational costs, which we'd accept is right across the country. That's not unique to Dublin or Galway or Cork or the big urban areas, about 8% um, in energy, 18% in food and beverages, 30% in linen service, 20% in, in insurance. What do you say to the fact that, you know, prices in Cavan Monaghan will be very competitive? Um, even with all of those increases? What will happen in any situation is that the, um, the hotelier will try to do the best they can for their value proposition. Um, some of the costs that are uh, increasing now, um, they have to just absorb them. They can't pass them on. And, and they, it can get to the situation where some businesses are marginal in terms of their profitability and then they will you know, get to a stage where they mightn't be viable anymore. And that will be a challenge somewhere. But, but look, what we're trying to look to is the positives. Um, we're hoping at some stage that the price of oil will settle, that this rampant inflation will settle, that the, uh, we'll get to some form of calmer waters in the future. Um, but the reality is we've come out of a pandemic which has been an absolute disaster for our industry. We're heading into now a situation where um, you know there's a, there's a war in Europe and there's a um, whole world challenge around supply side. There's a challenge around infl rapid inflation, and all of that is just uh, disrupting everything that's going on at the moment. And and to speak to Paul's point, um, you know, hotels are part of the infrastructure of the Irish economy. We're not just about tourism. The Irish economy um, has been progressing significantly despite COVID. <coughs> There's massive demand in inward investment and in construction and all of those um, you know, industries use hotels. Mm -hmm. What's happening then is we've got in parallel to that, we've got a tourism industry with, which was asked to close. Um, it was closed you know, more or less for two years. And when you close an industry like that, you can't just turn it back on at the turn of a switch. Yeah, no, what I we are that. now trying to uh, explain here today is we have serious problems. We're not going to be able to fix them overnight. Mm -hmm. We're doing the best we can. And we want to speak to the fact that there is still you know, a, an industry out there that's providing mostly, most of the stock is transacted at very uh, competitive rates and comparable to our peers right across Europe. And, and uh, in the end of the day, the, there, are, there is this negative comment around the last available rates. You know, we're not here to defend that. We're not here to defend And it those is rates. important to say Ireland is a lovely, wonderful place to holiday and still encourage people to do the staycation. Yeah. That's really important. And, and, and we have to be mindful of something as well, that infrastructure is expensive. It's very expensive in Ireland. So when we want to have a, a sustainable um, growth in our industry, you know, we want to build hotels in, in all parts of the country to, to, to support the wonderful products that we have. And that can only be done in a commercially viable way. And, and so in terms of what's going on in Dublin, you know, we know the, the limiting factors about the supply. You know, there has been challenges around um, planning issues. There has been challenges, or challenges around the cost to build. There has been challenges around um, the, the value of the property, particularly after the financial crash. And nobody can build a hotel, which was, might cost them 300,000 euros per room, if the day after you build it, it's worth 200,000, because the banks are nobody's going to fund that kind of thing. So there's a whole raft of issues out there. Yeah. Um, and you're going to have them all solved soon. Pardon? You're going to have them all solved soon. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, but look, there is, uh, and Paul mentioned as well, look, there was a, uh, we, we estimate there was a, a 3,000 bedrooms shortfall because of the pandemic. 
because mm -hmm. some of the the um, the uh, I suppose the the sites didn't come to, to closure or didn't finish up, and we expect then and hoping we're hoping that there might be about five thousand coming on by the end of 2024, and that will go some way to alleviate. Mm -hmm. Also, we will you know we don't know. Five thousand in Dublin or nationally? In Dublin. In Dublin, okay. Five thousand rooms in Dublin coming on stream. And there's also, you know, the, the, the question mark over the uh, the government contracts as to whether that, that will change. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to also say at this point in time that, you know, when um, the pandemic happened, uh, our industry uh, turned to the government and we said, what can we do to help? We helped with the emergency services. Um, you know, when the government came to us, um, uh, when the, the war in Ukraine broke out, you know, our industry put their hands up to say, what can we do to help? Nobody at that stage predicted what was going to happen in terms of the recovery in the economy and the recovery in tourism. And we're now caught in a situation where the real issue here, and we want to say it again, is supply. Okay, supply and on that note, I will challenge. have to draw today's hearing to conclusion i i'm sorry to uh, bernard and orla i feel like i haven't got to ask you anything but we have a second go <laughs> in a little while thank you very much thank you very much to you all for attending to bernard orla ruth uh, owen tim denise the two pauls uh, it's always very useful and informative and i do appreciate your attendance and your comprehensive um, presentations here today i want to thank my colleagues as well for their uh, question and their engagement in today's hearing and I am now going to suspend our meeting for our second session.